All right, good afternoon. All right, it's hot in Austin, I got to tell you. But it is, uh, it's such a delight to be here. And, you know, I, 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 it's, it's weird being in multiple families at the same time. So I, I love the tribe that I come from, but I love being a part of your tribe too. So thank you. Uh, let me just say thank you. And it's been one of the great joys of our lives to get to know your pastor and his wife and even his kids um, and the, the staff here. Boy, what God has given this house is remarkable. You can always tell what God has in store for people on the basis of the leaders that God gives that people. Hear me. And what God has given you with Pastor Chris, Brandy, the others, Pastor D, uh, I got to tell you, you have only scratched the surface of what God has for this house. I want you to hear this. You know, I, I, I remarked in the previous services that can you imagine for a moment your pastor that's been limited mobility, operating at a measure, uh, a level 7 to 10 pain for years, has done and accomplished what God had for him. Can you imagine the unrestricted version of Chris Gilkey? It's a little terrifying to think about for a second, you know, but just the ability to be able to run. And let me also say this, is that given his preference and given many of our preferences, God would have healed him supernaturally, sovereignly, in one of your Friday, Sunday night services. I mean, that would have been really cool, but that wasn't the journey that God had for him. But because of literally the journey that God had, and how many of you know that, that God will bring us through these narrow and restricted places in order, Scripture says, to do what? Bring us into wide open spaces. And it's very interesting as God kind of narrowed him physically, took him through the rigors of surgery, God showed him some wide open spaces, even wider than anything he'd ever seen before. And let me say that even in your own life, as you find yourselves at times in these squeeze shoots where you just feel like, I can't breathe, I don't want to go through this, let me just tell you, God's going to show up in the fire, you're going to be indelibly changed, and God's going to show you a largeness that you've never seen before. And even as God has done this with this man, that's also, it's prophetic for this house as well. I was sharing with a couple over dinner last night. I said, this church is coming into a culmination. It's the best way I know how to put it. All of these things converging at once. And it's, it's happening in, again, a global outpouring of God called revival. And everything is culminating at one time. Leadership, property, Revival, let me just tell you, the next few years in this church, they're going to be blistering. It's going to be amazing. Amen? Are you excited? Man, I'm excited. But you've been talking about heroes the last few weeks. Heroes. And I love heroes, biblical heroes. And you've been you know, recounting some of those, be it the Davids or the Moses or the Joshuas or whoever they might be. And we love, you know, we, we just love heroes. Part of the reason that we love Marvel comic strips, for instance. We love superheroes. But we love our military heroes, our sports heroes, those that have accomplished amazing things. You know, we came out of 9-11, and part of the big discourse at that time was a redefinition of heroes in our culture. Because previously, we had sort of euphemistically connected heroes with celebrity. And yet, what we saw with the horrendous events of 9-11, we saw kind of, quote-unquote, normal men and women, first responders, put their own lives in danger. And in many cases, a loss of life in order to save life. And so now, all of a sudden... Firemen, first responders, police, they all became heroes to us in our culture, as they should. But for us, 
I, for me, I was, I was having to think through this for a moment. So what defines a hero? And I came up with a very simple definition. It's just men and women able to recognize and then respond to both the opportunities and the, then the resulting opposition. It's no more complicated than that. Guess what? You know who the new faith heroes are? They're sitting in this room. Look around to the left and to the right. They're not the people on the billboards. They're not the people holding a microphone on the platform. They are men and women like you, like me, quite frankly, that are able, like the sons of Issachar, to understand the times in which we're living and know what to do, but not just know what to do, but to do it. And to do it in the face many times of opposition. And we live in such a moment as that right now. And you say, Pastor Jim, tell me you're not going to preach another message on revival. I'm going to preach another message on revival. Okay? I'm old. I repeat myself a lot now. All right? Just smile and nod like this is the first time you've heard it. But I'm going to continue to preach revival until we got it. Until we all are so saturated and squishy that we are leaving watermarks behind us. Because I believe that's where we are. And I know that that is what God has uniquely carved out for the rest of my life. Is to be sure that the capital C church are the right repository, the right vessels for the revival that God is sending from heaven. I'm so committed to this. As literally, my wife can tell you this, to pour out what, let, what, what energy that we have left is to be sure that we don't miss this opportunity. Because guess what? That's what will make us heroes. Yeah. That we don't miss it as God is bringing it. And what is revival again? It's, just a, it's both a sporadic and ongoing expressions of Pentecost. God pouring out his spirit, superimposing the kingdom of heaven on the kingdoms of this earth that we might be the vessels to transmit and transfer that reign and that revival. In the mid-1990s, I was helping to pastor a church in a little city in North Carolina. We had a move of God there, very unique. People were, you know, signs and wonders, miracles, people falling, laughing, running, Never seen anything like it. Part of it just violated my soul because I'm a control freak. And let me just tell you a little something about walking with God. If you are a control freak, you're in big trouble because God will violate you. Somebody said that he will violate your head to reveal your heart, okay? So I had to crawl around on the floor. I had to do some laughing in front of rooms full of people. You know, my worst nightmare as an introvert was manifested during that season. But as much fun as we had and as much power as we experienced, it was a river that never moved beyond the four walls of our building. We had a ball. We splashed water on one another. We took all the chairs out so people could fall down like cordwood. And we had a ball in that wading pool of the Spirit. But I didn't understand the realities of Ezekiel 47, that it was only as that river moved away from the altar that that river got deeper. And that river had the effect to release not only 12-month-a-year fruit-bearing trees, but to bring about fish of all kinds. See, that's what the river of God is about. It's not just that we can play and splash in it is so it gets deep enough to begin to affect our cities. And that's the reason that I love City Reach Church, even by its own nomenclature. Who in the world has a church named City Reach Church? I mean, you know, you don't got tabernacle in there anywhere. You don't got, I mean, I'm sorry. But, but inherent in the name is its mission. And I love that. But we didn't, I didn't have at that time, I, I, I had revelation, yes, but I didn't have enough revelation to really understand what this outpouring was truly intending to do. And revival always, it adds, it amplifies, it accelerates. 
And this is, this is one of the ways that we know that we are in the first outpourings of that which God is doing. But to receive, to step into these opportunities, we've got to be the vessels. Y'all have learned something about God. He doesn't waste anything. There is no experience of your life. There is no moment of your life. There is no hurt that God wastes. He uses it all. You want to talk about the ultimate recycler, heat a man. My wife, I try to throw something in the garbage can. She stops me every time. Oh, wait, what is that? What is that? Oh, I can juice that. You wouldn't believe what goes in our juicer, all right? It's disgusting. My wife chases me around the house with these glasses of brown goo. Oh, here, try this. This is not too bad, all right? You know, it'll be good for you. Anything that tastes like that's got to be good for me, all right? You start juicing donuts, and then we'll start talking, all right? But I'm trying to throw this away, and you're trying to juice it, all right? So if it doesn't get juiced, it gets composted. What can't get composted, obviously, we have to recycle that. So I'm just done with garbage. I just put it on the counter and let her deal with it. All right. Love my wife. All right. Wave, Angie. Thank you. God bless. All right. We just celebrated 46 years of marriage, by the way, on May 27th. But God is intent for us to be the vessels. He didn't waste anything. And he's looking for people, peoples, nations, that he can pour himself into, whereby which it won't be wasted. I want you to hear this. And those vessels we find in 2 Timothy 2, that if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use set apart. Guess what? You and I as the ecclesia, the church, we are what? Set apart. As holy. Just hang on to that. Useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. There it is. Every good work. So let's talk for a moment about vessels. Some years ago, I spoke about wineskins. Wineskins obviously being the means of transport and delivery of liquids in antiquity. Pretty disgusting, really, technology if you think about it because you take the skin of a dead animal you sew it up and you put your stuff in it all right i not interested okay god bless yeti that means there's some advantages of being alive in 2024 all right but the wine skin was how we moved liquids and yet that wine skin had a unique property those of you that are hunters understand this but a wine a, a skin of an animal is at its maximum flexibility closest to the death of the animal from which it was taken. So mortality yields greater flexibility. Greatest flexibility yields the greatest capacity. So guess what? Our capacity many times is directly related to those things that we allow to die around our lives. It gives us the greatest flexibility. Oh, my goodness. And so, and we know that as God is pouring out new wines of revival, guess what? We're going to, we, we can't be old wineskins for that. And that means that, that, that much of the way that we've acted in the past, that we've done, that even God has smiled and breathed upon, guess what? There's a new wineskin that God is crafting to receive this new wine, but it's going to require death. We're going to have to die to some old ideas, some old ideals, some old, uh, some old expectations and specifications of what this might really look like. Amen? But let's talk about three containers specifically mentioned in Scripture. I want to talk about jars and cups and bowls. First of all, are jars. Now, if you'll allow me for a moment just to paint a broad stroke, the jars I'm speaking of are these jars from antiquity, they, they, antiquity they, they stand about this tall, usually holding about 20 or 30 gallons. Uh, my wife and I have been to, to Israel a couple of times, many of you have, and so you see many of these at, 
that, that come out of archaeological digs. And we find a story over in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. We see this woman, her husband was a prophet. He obviously passed away. He wasn't good with money. Leaves her in debt, and they've come to take her children to sell into slavery to satisfy her debts. In those days, you didn't get to reorganize with the bank. They just came and took the kids. So this is a very extreme moment, if you can imagine the life of this mother. Not only is she now a widow, she's about to lose her kids. The prophet Elisha comes and says, what do you have? A little oil. Now, he already knows where this is going. But something had to happen prior to this miracle. He said, get every container you can find. Send your boys out. Knock on the doors of your neighbors and get containers. She did that. Close the door, begin to pour. And as long as there was space, the oil flowed. But when the containers got full, the oil stopped. Sold the oil based on the word of the prophet, paid off her debts, and it says, lived on the rest. She was set for life. Now, that's a cool story. The only problem was her entire city could have stepped into that same wealth if she could have continued to put empty vessels under that oil that was being flowed out. I mean, again, it's a great story. Her needs got met. But how many times do we stop right there? God, I got mine. Thank you very much. I don't have time to even unpack this, but I'll give you an asterisk, and I'll preach this sometime later. It's many times where in worship we stop with the presence of God and don't move all the way to the glory of God is we get our needs met in God's presence, but we don't press through to his glory. Even Moses had fellowship. He had the presence of God, the voice of God. He was a friend of God, but he said, now show me your glory. We stop because we get our needs met. How many times, even in the contemporary church, I get my need met. I get my body healed. I get my bank account filled up. I get my fellowship needs met, et cetera, and so forth. But we stop right there, and we wonder why the oil stops. It's because we've gotten full. But it's not just about you and I getting full. It's about us getting out of the house, bring empty vessels into the house that they might in turn be filled. That's how a church keeps the oil flowing, right there. It's not just great worship. It's not just great preaching. It's not just great systems and programs. It's whether or not there's a place for the oil to flow. Then we move to the New Testament. Jesus, first inscripturated miracle. Ooh, 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 I got that, I got that. Wedding at Cana, water and the wine. Yes, I'm a biblical scholar now. Okay, good for you. And yes, that was his first recorded miracle. Now, mama prodded him into it, but that's a whole nother story. Boy, don't make me look bad. But what's interesting is that he looked over there, and there were empty, what? Water jars, each holding 20 to 30 gallons that were usually used for the water for ceremonial washing. But Jesus thought, okay, go fill those up with water. Now, obviously, the big miracle was the water into wine, and it was good wine. But without the vessels, the miracle could have never happened. Are, are, are you hearing something here? And so the reality is the heavy lifting is always done on God's part, but God still has a part for you and I to play. And if it's nothing else, it's to show up empty. And come on, we're Americans. Well, Empty? I live in barbecue country. I ain't empty, baby. I'm going to go eat barbecue till I'm stupid, all right? We, we love full. Every one of us are closet hoarders. That's why you have no empty closets in your house. That's why you open, open one of your closets. You, you open a closet and start praying in tongues because you're terrified. Just, you know, you're going to die in the avalanche. Because we know what it's like being full, but it's so it's foreign for us to be empty. And yet Jesus' promise was he's coming to fill where? Hunger and thirst. Oh, my. Jars. Two chapters later, he has another encounter 
with a woman in a jar at the well. You remember this? Everything's wrong. A Samaritan woman talking to a Jew, a woman talking to a man. Everything is wrong with the scenarios. The disciples are saying, has he lost his mind? What is he doing over there? And even the woman recognized, how is it that you would you are asking me for a drink of water? He said, woman, if you had any idea who it was you were talking to, you'd be asking me for water. And she was thinking, as a matter of fact, I can give you water that she would never have to come back to this well. She's thinking, ooh, indoor plumbing. I'm all about this. Because she had no understanding spiritually of what he was talking about. Except he begins to chat with her a bit after she tries to debate theology and worship with him. And finally begins to give him a word of knowledge and says, and you've been married this many times. And the man that you are married to, or excuse me, you're living with is not your husband. I perceiveth that thou wast a prophet, you think? <laughs> but on the basis of one word of knowledge, he says she went back to the city. And she says, come see a man who told me about my life. See, she came to a well to get a physical need met. She left being a well herself, being full of living water. Jesus wants to turn us into wells. Not always having to come to the well of Chris Gilkey's pulpit. Always come to the well of coming down here to the altar. He's wanting that well. Out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. But to do that, we become the vessels. Are you with me here? And let me say this, and i got to move real fast here. But let's, you know, many times we want our vessels to get pretty. We want our vessels to be whole and, you know, fine porcelain and all of it. Let me tell you, that's not what the Word says. The Word says that we have this treasure now in what? Jars of clay, it says in 2 Corinthians. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You know, your vessel may look a little wonky. That's all right. We're all wonky vessels. That'd be a great name for a rock band, by the way. Wonky vessel. Or at least a Chris, contemporary Christian music. How, how about CCM band, all right? Wonky vessel. But the reality is many of us want our vessels fixed so we don't hurt anymore. Jesus wants our vessels fixed so they can contain him. You have people that are just bags with holes, pour, 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 and it all just pours right back out. Jesus wants us whole so that we can do what? Retain him as he pours himself out into us. Amen? Amen. Jars. But then they're cups. We move to the New Testament. Jesus There at that Passover meal, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. This is a cup of redemption, forgiveness, grace. It is a cup of reminder that Jesus has come to establish a new covenant, a better covenant, Scripture says. And a covenant that didn't negate the old, it perfectly fulfilled it. Many times we just think, "Woo! I'm glad I'm not under all that. You are bound by that. You are judged by that. But Jesus has come to fulfill it on our behalf. He's always dealt with his people on the basis of covenant. It's a word that means little to us anymore unless you're in a condo association. But it's a powerful biblical concept of how God relates to us. And Jesus comes with that cup. And we are reminded of everything that he did for us. But then there's another cup. It's called the cup of iniquity. You know, you can have a vessel, it doesn't, a, a, a cup, a container, and it's full, and you continue to pour into it. Tell me what happens. It overflows. Displacement. Now, even if you don't shake the table or tilt the container, simply because the vessel is full, that whatever is added to it is going to cause what's in it to do what? Overflow. The Bible refers to this principle as sowing and reaping. And let me just tell you that there is an overflowing cup of iniquity. And we say, oh, that, ooh, that's a version of God I'm not interested. God didn't do it. It's consequential. I want you to hear me. Are you with me? Now, even if God were to have done it, 
He's a right, righteous, holy judge who could and should do it at any time. But we are beginning to see now, whether it's in the church, whether it's in individuals' lives, whether it's in the nations, we're beginning to see now this cup of iniquity beginning to do what? Boil over. What's in it is coming out, and there is effect. And this is one of the reasons, again, why these moments of revival become such a conundrum for us. It's just like, well, surely the cup of iniquity would not be poured out concurrent with revival and rain and new wine. I'm here to tell you, yes, they are. And don't be surprised because one doesn't negate the other. They happen concurrently. And, you know, we look many times and we, we see God do certain things. And I don't know about you, but I look at certain passages or certain individuals in Scripture Nadab and Abihu there at the ordination service there with, uh, with, with Daddy Aaron and, and Uncle Moses. And, and God strikes the boys dead in the midst of the ordination service. Uzzah just keeping the ark from falling off the cart. God kills him. Ananias and Sapphira not calculating their tithe correctly. God takes them out. How many of you get to get a moment of tithes and offerings? I better do the math right. No, it's not... It's not that fragile. But see, what we don't understand is the context by which this became a culminating event. We don't know what the background is of all of this other stuff. Are you with me? It's, 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 not, it's not unlike, for instance, a, 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 a kid that gets kicked out of school. Well, I got kicked out of school for chewing gum. Really? That's powerful. Yeah, tell me about the first 59 demerits you got. All right, we don't talk about that. And so what we don't know is that God is not just a random, capricious God. Is that in all of these cases, what we don't know is what led up to that final moment where that last drop went into the cup and it boiled over. Are you with me? But then there's one last. And it's bowls. We find a final story. Second Kings, once again, the second chapter. The prophet Elisha is there at Jericho. Now, understand Jericho was a prime piece of real estate. If you remember about Jericho, it was, it was the, first, uh, the first conquest as the children came over into promise, came over uh, into Cana. And Jericho was standing there in the way. And so, they, as you know the story, it was defeated. They took it. Uh, it was a place that was consecrated to God. And Joshua placed a curse on Jericho and said, Cursed is anyone who attempts to rebuild the city. There was a, a recorded instance in Scripture. Somebody tried, calls him their firstborn. But here we are 500 years later, and the men are coming to the prophet and saying the land is well situated, but the water's bad and the land is unproductive. Not unlike Austin. Not unlike the United States. But the water's bad. What did the prophet say? Bring me a new bowl, put salt in it. New bowl representing something, one, that was previously empty and not been sullied by anything else. Put salt in that bowl. Salt representing a purifying, a cleansing agent. And it says as he poured the salt into the water supply, it said it made the water fresh. And to this day, that water has remained fresh and the land has been productive. How many of you know God has called you and I to be that salt? He has called you and I to be poured out into our cities and into our communities to break the curse and to heal the water. This is something God's called the church to. But to do that, we got to first be sure that our salt hasn't lost its savor. Jesus talked about that, that once salt loses its savor, it's only good for traction underfoot. That's all it's good for anymore. You know how salt loses its savor? You put it next to something, unlike it, and it draws out its salinity and its savor. This has been a picture of the church. As the church has gotten next to the world, the church has lost its savor. Now, we are called not to be of the world, but we're called to the world. And there's a difference. 
that we should look very, very different than the places that God has called us to be. And let me tell you, he's going to get that salt moved one way or the other. Out of the shaker. And you can either shake it or God will shake it. Completely up to you. And one last, one last point about bowls. There's this beautiful picture in Revelation. Worship's happening. And they're playing harps and they're also holding bowls. And those bowls, it says, represents the incense of the prayers of the saints. And God showed me so clearly. He said, son, I'm about to tilt over bowls of intercession back into the culture, back into the church. Let me tell you, there are prayers that were prayed generations ago. You don't even know what they are that you are about to become beneficiaries of. Hear me. Talk about reaping where you've not sown. That is what revival does. And I saw heaven beginning to tilt these bowls. Remember, I said that revival accelerates. Let me tell you, there are bowls of unanswered prayer that are about to become answered prayer. I heard a leader say this, churches don't grow on the basis of prayer. They grow on the basis of answered prayer. Hear me. There are answered prayers on the way. What have I said this morning? Vessels of revival. Be they jars, cups, bowls. The real question for you and me, are we available? Are we empty? Have we postured and positioned ourselves under the downspout of heaven that we might receive that which he's pouring out in this hour? Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' name.